Hello, my name is Fiona Wong from thewildpixel.com and today we are going to be doing Bonnie and Clyde's human design charts. So if you don't know who they are, Bonnie and Clyde was this crime duo that was active between 1932 and 1934 and they made their name alongside other celebrity criminals such as Pretty Boy Floyd or Babyface Nelson and this was during the height of the Great Depression. This is called the public enemy era and this marked the beginning of lawmen being required to carry firearms, interstate police working together, bank robberies being charged with federal crime. So this post explores the story of Bonnie and Clyde through human design. Since there's no official birth time on record, for either of them, their charts were run through software for any sorts of consistencies and inconsistencies. So only the parts of their respective charts that did not change were used for this reading. I do want to give a trigger warning that details of Bonnie, Clyde, and the Barrow Gang's experiences, which includes killing, kidnapping of lawmen, robberies, poverty, loss, self-mutilation, and rape, are mentioned in this post. There will be no other trigger warnings outside of what I am telling you right now. No, no images or anything like that related to violent crime or killing is going to be in this post. So first, let's talk about Clyde Barrow's potential human design type. So his birth date is actually made up of manifestors. There is a small window where he could have been a manifesting generator, but due to this split that he has in between his sacral center um, during those hours, his manifestor side would have been what was connected to his throat anyway. And based on his life's decisions, his need for control and his birthday time windows, I think that he is a textbook manifestors. And when we're talking about manifestors, we have this saying that manifestors get in a car and they go zero to a hundred. And if you don't like it, you can get out because they're just going to run you over. And if you annoy them, you poke at them, you're getting kicked out of the car. So don't get in a manifestors way when they are, they're about to do something when they're kind of tunnel visioned on this thing. There are manifestors for a reason. They're the only type that's not designed to wait for a reason. Manifestor types, they were the leaders of the old world prior to 1780 when projectors came about. So the world of the manifestors, they had to dethrone other people or they got dethroned by cutting off their head. Not not like literally, I mean, I'm sure it was literal at that point in time, but in the modern day, I just say it's figurative. So a classic interpretation of the manifestor type is that zero to a hundred. And again, this isn't a literal interpretation for manifestors, but for Clyde Barrow, it's literal. Clyde was known for being good at driving fast. So if you think about car chases in an action movie, that's how Clyde drove. And he was so controlling over his vehicles. His vehicle of choice was a Ford V8, by the way. He stole a bunch of V8s. He kind of refused to drive anything but a V8. Otherwise, he would not let any other members of the gang do anything like that. And if they ended up trying to drive, he would just say no. He wouldn't let them. The only time he let other people drive was if it was absolutely necessary for a getaway car. And Bonnie did that for him before she lost her ability to walk or use her legs. She did that for him. And we're going to touch upon that throughout this reading. So he would actually rather drive eight hours by himself than trust someone else behind the wheel. And what's also kind of impressive is that he drove with two toes missing and he didn't wear shoes. When he was in East Ham prison farm, he deliberately cut off two of his toes, one of them being the big toe, using an ax because he wanted to get out of the harsh farm work environment. And his first time in prison was for failing to return a rental car. He was 21 years old and roughly 125 pounds, which is about 56.7 kg. And that's when he was sentenced to East End Prison Farm. So for a single rental car that his family couldn't afford to pay back, it is a Great Depression, right? He faced a year of daily beatings, lack of food, and he was raped every single day by a much larger inmate. And the guards would actually reward this inmate with extra food or giving him weapons and things like that. It was encouraged by the guards. This rapist was actually in a feud with another inmate, Aubrey Scaly, and Scaly was already serving a life sentence. And Scaly gave Clyde a makeshift weapon after about a year of this rapist assaulting Clyde every single day. And Scaly said, if Clyde killed this rapist, Scaly would take all the blame. So C Clyde killed him. And Scaly held up to his end of the bargain as well. This marked the first time that Clyde successfully dethroned someone who was holding power. And this was in prison. This was during his time in prison and for the rest of his really short life he would fantasize and scheme ways he could go back to east ham with more firepower kill all the guards and release all of the prisoners so next let's talk about bonnie parker and bonnie actually hated this uh picture of her but sorry bonnie this is one of my favorite pictures of you and one of the most i guess well-known pictures of her so if she was born before 5 p.m central time she would likely be a projector if she was born after 5 p.m central time she would most likely be a generator but based on how introspective and dependent she was on outside socialization 
I think she's a projector. And if she was a projector, there's a large window where she would have been a mental projector. Now, mental projectors do not operate like other projectors. The rest of us, people that do not have a mental authority, we feel our authority internally. Mental projectors and reflectors are the only ones that have an outer authority. So mental authorities experience this like echolocation around them and they're just waiting for information to bounce around, return, and then leave again so these answers can solidify. Now this authority isn't about logical reasoning. We think mental logical reasoning, right? No, it is It is about this echolocation that is happening. So it is the ability to hold space for information and then let it piece together over time. So Bonnie did serve about a year in prison and while in prison she she spent a lot of time writing poetry and when she got out of prison and she was running with Clyde and the Barrow Gang, she would haul around this typewriter so she can edit one of the favorite poems that she wrote, which is called Suicide Sal. Now, her family felt that Bonnie was a little bit introspective and self-aware and she always knew that she and Clyde lived on this borrowed time and despite her mother, Emma's repeated pleas for her to stay home, Bonnie told her family that she intended to stay with Clyde and die with him. But Bonnie had to be recognized and invited by the Barrow Gang because who in the 1930s is bringing women to robberies? Like who's doing that? You know, and aside from their relationship, Clyde, Clyde invited Bonnie to go with them. You know, hauling a woman around isn't something that was like fancy or like whatever. Women were usually considered groupies when they're doing things like that. But Bonnie was actively in the Barrow Gang, directly invited by Clyde. Now, Bonnie, I'm going to switch over to this image. Bonnie likely had an open G center. So it is that diamond center that I have in the middle over there. And Bonnie's intention to die alongside Clyde shows how much she saw herself in him. The G-Center is a center of love, direction, identity. So being open, Bonnie would have learned what love was through the people she was attracted to, even if it was platonic. And it's a misconception that people with the undefined or G-Center don't have their own identities. They actually cultivate their identities through relatability to another person and will often identify with other people in kind of like an alter ego manner. However, that open G is really susceptible to other people projecting an identity onto them. And if the open G is frantically looking for anyone to identify with, they can actually force themselves to adopt those projected identities. So let's note some things that in the 1930s, the media said about Bonnie. So one, they called her a seductress, this loose woman who slept with multiple members of the Barrow Gang. She didn't. She, that she takes this sadistic joy out of killing and she actually hated it and would try to care for their hostages as best as she could. Three, they called her unladylike because of her kind of gun-toting, uh, cigar-smoking lifestyle, this picture. And she didn't actually smoke cigars. It was a prop. She took it out of another Barrow Gang member's uh, mouth and was just like, take a picture of me. So that's supposedly how this picture came about. Now, there was this police chief. His name was Percy Boyd. And he recalled taking a liking to Bonnie because she took care of him when they held him hostage. There was a shootout and they scraped his head with a bullet. The Barrow Gang couldn't aim, all right? But Bonnie actually made Clyde stop the car so she could clean and tend Boyd's wounds. And he said that she made really pleasant conversation. When they released Boyd, he asked her, he wanted to do her a favor and said, is there anything that you want to tell the press? And Bonnie and Clyde loved reading about themselves. When they, when their cars were just found wherever, they would find like these heaps of papers and clippings related to what people wrote about them. But her only request to Chief Boyd was to tell the press that she didn't smoke cigars. That's what she wanted to tell. So of all the things, this is what she didn't want her identity to be associated with. But let's get to the good stuff. You're watching this video because we are going to be blending what's what we can about their charts. So you're actually looking at two incomplete charts. I just grabbed the stuff that were that was consistent just so I can merge it together. So they could potentially have more channels, more gates, whatever it is. But I worked with what I could find and the stuff that didn't change. So a connection chart explores the combination of two people's charts, no more, no less. So unlike most compatibility systems, human design focuses on what each person brings to the relationship and then watches it happen. There is no more compatible or less compatible. I mean, a generic sense, like I've written a blog post about compatibility. It's a very generic sense of it. What I'm saying right now about a manifestor and projector relationship, it's about how it shows up for Bonnie and Clyde. It is not relevant to any other manifestor projector relationship ever. It is their very specific charts coming together. So in this post, I'm going to go over their electromagnetic channels and electromagnetic channels. Just imagine two people climbing this mountain. However, they need to combine their individual toolkits together in order to get up there. So both of them bring something equal to the table to ensure that success. Now, the next thing is we're going to talk about compromise channel. So 
in that mountain climbing analogy, think about both of them climbing that mountain, but one of them can get to the top. The other person needs like that person to kind of hoist them up. And that is what a compromise channel is. The person who is getting up top by themselves, they have the channel and the person who's kind of, you know, getting halfway up, they are learning from that compromise channel. Now, the last channels we're going to look at are dominance channels. And imagine in the mountain climbing, one person is climbing all the way up and the other person is kind of just chilling and watching. So, and I am going to talk about some of the gates. You can see them uh, circled when I talk about the channels. Well, you can kind of see them uh, circled in this image too. But all of the gates I am talking about in this post are specific to Bonnie and Clyde. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about the electromagnetic channels. So here are their electromagnetic channels. Wherever you see a channel that is half pink and half blue equally, that's where the electromagnetic channels are. And if you see that they're, all the blue ones belong to Clyde and all the pink ones belong to Bonnie. And remember, this is how they both complement each other in the drain. They both equally bring something to the table in order to, and I want to quickly say that a channel is not one plus one equals two. We're not just combining these channels. Think of think of baby making, right? When it's one plus another person, like, and you're creating a baby, that's three people. It's not one plus one equals, you know, two people. It's one plus one coming together makes the channel. So if you're kind of just like, hmm, that channel doesn't really sound like a combination of those two. It's like, well, a baby takes, right? So a little bit of traits from mom, dad, whoever else is in the picture, but it is still its own unique entity. So I want you to think of channels in that way as I'm talking about it. So it doesn't seem too confusing. So the first channel we're talking about is the channel of abstraction and abstraction. And you can kind of see, um, I drew an arrow there. So Clyde comes in with 64 and that is where that little blue thing is. And people with 64 that, you know, in this context and Clyde's context, they kind of, they're really quick with coming up with vague answers. And Bonnie brings in 47, which kind of oscillates between this like optimism and hopelessness. Like, oh, well, well, like we can do this. We can do this. Oh my gosh. Like we're just going to die. So that's kind of um, what Bonnie brings to that. So she was actually really optimistic about getting out of the life of crime and understanding that they could die at any time. And from what I have researched about Bonnie and Clyde based on um, kind of what people have talked about with them, it wasn't necessarily that they just wanted to do these things. Bonnie and Clyde did want to settle down. They did really love each other and wanted to have a life together. I mean, they did, I guess. It just happened the way it happened. So when Bonnie met Clyde, she was 19 years old. She couldn't find a job. Her husband was in prison for robbery and she just wanted to be this Broadway star. She wanted to be a poet. She just wanted stuff that was grand. She wanted to be famous. So when she met Clyde, she saw her ticket out of her boring life. And Clyde, he's designed, he's really good at these sudden short-term decisions, but it was Bonnie who picked up the slack on the other end of that. So that's a channel of abstraction. Next, we're going to talk about the channel of transformation. So if you look at that, um, Clyde brings 54. So uh, channel of transformation is about creating wealth, but it requires the correct allies. So that's where the Barrow Gang really comes into the picture in when it comes to this connection. So Clyde 54, he prizes loyalty, especially when it comes to people who are disadvantaged. He kind of saw himself as a martyr. And he gets really angry when loyalty isn't reciprocated. Like Clyde was known to have these explosive bouts of anger. Now I want to pause here and talk about manifester types. Their not self is anger. Now imagine a manifester having to sit in a car with all of these people that that they might not like, people that they didn't want to travel with and they were kind of stuck with them. Imagine a manifester having to deal with something like that. That is where that anger not self comes in and with Clyde that loyalty really had to be reciprocated. As we talk about um, Clyde and Bonnie more, you will see how important loyalty was to Clyde. Now on Bonnie's side, on 32 side, she is um, very instinctual, but I am actually using the fear gate definition of um, 32, which talks about that instinct. She is very instinctual, intuitive, but she also has this like deep seated fear of failing. Now, when we are talking about, um, when we are talking about this sense of intention to create wealth, but they they require these correct allies to, to help them out with it. And one of the things that was really important to the to Bonnie and Clyde were their families. They both mutually were super close to their families and the Barrow and Parker families were often gifted money and presents from the duo. They would try to visit at least once a month or at least during the holidays. Now, sometimes the money was like up to a hundred dollars, which is about, you know, a thousand four hundred dollars today in 2024, as I've looked it up. And for a pair that only really successfully robbed grocery and convenience stores that wasn't making a whole lot of money anyway, during the great depression, a hundred dollars was a lot, especially since they were living out of cars. 
Now, Marie Barrow, who is Clyde's younger sister, said that Clyde's gifts often save them from going hungry. Family was important to both of them. Bonnie's mother was actually really prideful. She was one of those women that cared a lot about public perception and things like that. She she initially would never allow that kind of money in her hand. She would not accept money like that, but it got to a point that even her mom kind of just took the money. She needed it. So family was really important to both of them. And they would also drive members of the Barrow gang to visit their families. If the gang's just like, just drive me home. Like, I can't do this anymore. Or, you know, I want to see my mom, like whatever. They would actually go and try to take these Barrow gang members to visit their families. And what was interesting about Clyde was he, there was this uh, other person, another member of the Barrow gang. He was only 16 when he joined. And he, he was wanting that glamorous lifestyle that he assumed Bonnie and Clyde had. And they didn't have that. And his kid, his name was W.D. Jones. And he just wasn't about that life. And at some point, things got really ugly. And Clyde ended up just taking him home and to his family and say, hey, if you get in trouble, just pin everything on me. And this was a common thing for Clyde to do. He even told Bonnie, like, maybe just stay home with your mom. Like, after they've, you know, done all this, like, just tell them that I forced you to do this. So you can kind of see how important things like that, how loyalty was so important to Clyde, not just one way, not just in a controlling way, but also reciprocated. So if you kind of have this mentality, especially if you are a manifester, that you are this um, dictator or tyrant, you might be, you could be, but I want you to also see the other side of a manifester. There is sides to manifestors such as you scratch my back, I scratch your back. It doesn't mean that they just strong arm everyone to fit their willpower. However, we are going to talk about how Clyde also did that. So the next one that we are going to be talking about is a channel of judgment. And this is the one on the bottom. This is about creating structures and even criticisms to ensure a better life for loved ones and stuff. And if you think about the word judgment, it's almost like judging, like, this isn't good enough. This isn't good enough for my mom to live in. This isn't good enough for the life I want, the life that I want for my family. That is a channel of judgment, at least in relation to compatibility chart and the way that these two ran around together. So on Clyde's side, we got 58. And this is this decadent and indulging lifestyle and he also becomes unstable when he gets too much to handle now bonnie on the other hand she can get obsessive over trying to help now let's be clear clyde and the barrow gang killed at least nine lawmen while they were active and yet some of the hostages they took mentioned that they were treated well and police chief percy boyd which we talked about in the beginning that bonnie treated he had nice things to say about Bonnie and Clyde actually tried to steal change from a gum machine to get food and gas while they had a uh, police chief Boyd hostage and Boyd like saw it and was just like he tried to give Clyde $25 which is about $350 today but Clyde refused he would not take his hostages money and instead he took the change the change that he stole from this gumball machine and he used it to feed himself Bonnie WD Jones and and Boyd right and when he released Boyd, Boyd was so, he felt that Boyd was so easy to work with. He didn't try to fight, didn't try to struggle. Boyd kind of knew like, all right, I'm with Bonnie and Clyde. I could die. Obviously he was scared, but because he didn't really like aggravate them, he wasn't trying to fight them. Clyde actually didn't, wanted to treat him well. And obviously Boyd, they were just, they were just in a gunfight earlier. So for that to happen and Clyde to take him hostage, like Boyd was covered in blood and he wanted Boyd to show up in a respectable manner. He he made Boyd take off all these bloody clothes and he dressed the police chief in this fresh shirt, the suit coat and tie, and then they released him really close to town. Now, he doesn't give everyone this treatment. People that annoyed Clyde or Clyde just straight up felt that they were kind of aggravating to polls and stuff in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the country, where they would have to try to get out and then hike back into the closest town. And this could be for miles. So this isn't like a thing that Bonnie and Clyde did for everyone. It there's extremes to Bonnie and Clyde and Bonnie, well, Clyde primarily, he believed that the Barrow gang should always be dressed nicely. Now I just talked about that decadent and indulging lifestyle and this extended to how he wanted his hostage to look like he wanted him to look respect. I read that. I thought that was like a really strange contrast when it, when it came to these two. We're going to talk about compromise channels, which is what you see on the screen right now. And these are, they only have two compromise channels and the name in the parentheses is the person who has the whole channel. So if you think about it, this is that climbing up the mountain, but one has to help the other up. So once again, anything that is primarily pink belongs to Bonnie and anything that is primarily blue belongs to Clyde. So the term compromise and compromise channel, that can be pretty misleading because they didn't really have to compromise too much. Bonnie was more than happy to partake and help Clyde. Remember, she could have left at any time and Clyde would not have faulted her. That's something that Clyde has proven over and over again. If he helped somebody or someone participated in crime with him, 
and they wanted to leave, he would even tell them like, hey, just pin this on me. Like, just do that. Bonnie had an out the whole time. And she was just more than happy to be with Clyde and partake in whatever he was doing. And he was more than happy to take care of Bonnie. So let's, let's talk about the channel of structure that comes from Bonnie. So for Clyde, he has gate 43 here. And this is about pushing through any goal or challenges, especially when it comes to those who oppose it. And this is one of the deaf gates in human design, 43. And people that have this deaf gate, they have a pretty fixed way of thinking. Well, I'm going to say fix. It's once they tunnel on something, they tunnel on something. Good luck trying to get them out of that tunnel. And then let me say good luck trying to get a manifester out of that tunnel. You're just going to get run over. It is what it is. So Bonnie here has the whole channel and this is about the ability to put patterns together and innovate but it does require letting go of that control especially because Clyde's kind of just the fixation of control here but Bonnie understands that you have to release some of that control for things to come together now it is unclear how much influence Bonnie had on Clyde's decisions Clyde was really kind of like the centerpiece of the show especially back then people just thought Bonnie was this groupie they just thought that it was some woman that you know was always on Clyde's arm like Clyde's girlfriends right but um we actually, so we don't really know if Bonnie had a hand in Clyde's ideas, but due to this time period, she may have just not received any credit for it. But with the channel of structure, we see that Clyde has that firm grip on control, but for the sake of practicality. So after Clyde got out of East End prison, he didn't forget how Aubrey Scaly gave him a weapon to kill his rapist. And this created Bonnie's first task for the Barrow Gang. Bonnie walked right into East End prison and told the guards that she was Scaly's cousin. No one suspects this four foot 11 girl to be capable of doing something to help a convict. And Clyde was so adamant about paying Scaly back and Bonnie was there to deliver the plan. You know, there's no way Clyde knew what she was doing in there. She had to go in there and obviously like she only had so much control. She's in a prison. She's visiting somebody that has a life sentence and she was able to deliver the message and get out and no one was the wiser. And for that moment, Bonnie got to live out her dream of being an actress. Okay, so Clyde will always, well, he always, for the rest of his life, have this vendetta against Lawman due to what happened to him in East Ham. And while he never really had the firepower or the people to take on the whole prison, he would find ways to help people who helped him. And some were recruited into the Barrow Gang. Now, members of the Barrow Gang, they came and went pretty quickly except for Bonnie. Clyde had these schemes and he had the willpower, but Bonnie had the capacity to deal with Clyde's controlling leadership style. Now, when Jeff Gwynn was writing and researching Bonnie Parker and uh, Clyde Barrows, he said that loyalty was one of Bonnie's most distinguishable characteristics. And she constantly told her family that unrelenting persecution by the laws pressured Clyde into becoming a career criminal. And he also murdered multiple people. And what she said was, they made him what he is today. He used to be a nice boy, but folks like us haven't got a chance. Jeff added, modern day psychologists, they would just call Bonnie an enabler. So Clyde has the channel of money. Like, who's surprised? Who's surprised here? So Clyde has to be in control and he will retaliate when people try to control him. Other people have to submit to his willpower if they wanted to join in that journey to gather these resources this money and other material assets. Bonnie, on the other hand, she scopes people out. And for her, the leadership came in relation to money and materialistic goals. Now, Clyde's need for being in control was about power. And that is true for many manifestors. Manifestors are said to lead with power while projectors are here to lead with influence. So he also felt like other people are just not capable to get the job done the way he is. And that is something that manifestors deal with a lot. Manifestors see things about 10 steps ahead, whether they are correct or not. And it's difficult for the rest of us to really relate to that, to what that manifestor is seeing. We're just not there. We're all designed to wait while the manifestor's there to do. So sometimes manifestors like that I read for are like, I should just do it myself. It's aggravating for me to outsource this or have somebody else do it. But his forms of control actually wasn't about forcing people to submit through violence. It was all about self-preservation. Trying to get a stable job when he was out of East End prison, but he was constantly harassed by police, whatever workplace that he had. So being pulled out for interviews, like being pulled out for whatever reasons, obviously his bosses were like, you're gone too much. Like this is too much of a hassle. So you're fired. And he ended up getting fired from multiple jobs that he tried to keep. So he retaliated for the rest of his life. Now, Clyde, if Clyde was giving the choice during a robbery, he would just grab the cash and run. He preferred the Barrow Gang to flee rather than fight. And when they took hostages, they intended to release them as long as the hostages didn't try anything. Kind of like what I talked about with Police Chief Boyd. Now, members who joined the Barrow Gang were 
familiar with the sensationalized glamorous frenzy written in the papers. So they were really underwhelmed when they realized Clyde didn't rob banks. He robbed grocery stores and convenience stores, and they weren't making much money during the Great Depression. And Clyde didn't like going in and out, like just guns blazing, but that's what his recruits wanted. These were kids, 16 years old, 21, 22 years old. These were kids. And they just saw this glamorous lifestyle that was such a contrast with the Great Depression that they're living with. They were just like, I want this life. I want this glamorous life. And that's just not what it was for Bonnie and Clyde. Like they were living out of the car, like Bonnie was pooping in the woods. <laughs> they were bathing in creeks. They didn't have a whole lot of money. They had to camp out for days at a time. It's It just wasn't that glamour. And there's, they're usually, they're in control and they're normally seen as like these dictators and tyrants by other people because they do not need to be elected to lead. All right, they do not need to be elected. They're just born a certain way. And Clyde, one of his forms of control was through anger. He did not like people complaining and he didn't like people firing weapons unnecessarily. He actually didn't like gunfights. His gang, the people that he recruited that wanted that glamorous lifestyle, that's what they wanted. But some of them froze up during the job. One of them discharged a weapon. And we're going to talk about that um, here in a bit towards the end of this reading. So other so other things that happened because of his anger was it was so difficult for them to retain members of the Barrow Gang because one, the whole lack of glamour, and two, Clyde's anger. Now, other forms of resource, money, material control included what his gang were, the treatment of hostages, when, where they ate, where they came, the fate of the people that he looked out for. And I just don't, I don't mean that just in like a bad way. I'm talking about when he told some of his, his former gang members to just pin things on him. Even that, how they left was some sort of control. He also controlled his alcohol intake. Now, Bonnie was known to have an alcohol problem after Clyde crashed a car that spilled battery acid all over her legs. He let her have as much whiskey as she wanted for the pain, but Clyde always stayed sober. He was ready to make a run for it at any moment. Now, Bonnie didn't really have notable relationships with other members of the gang. Any account of interacting with Bonnie were usually with people who harbored them. And back then, people were going to, like, they brought presents, they brought food, they brought money, and people are not going to turn that down during the Great Depression. So anyone that spoke about her was usually people who harbored them or their hostages or family. Bonnie loved to socialize, and people either found her underwhelming, like, people thought she wasn't really that pretty, they thought she was just this, like, Marilyn Monroe-esque figure, right? But whether they were underwhelmed by her or beguiled by her charm, she kind of was the more human side of the Barrow Gang. So the last thing we're going to talk about are Bonnie and Clyde's dominance channel. So remember, when we're thinking about climbing the mountain, this person is climbing the whole mountain and the other person's like, yay, or like learning from it, whatever it is, the other person doesn't have that channel. That's all that means. So in this image, any name in parentheses is the person that has that dominance channel. So the first one, when you're looking at this image, the name in parentheses is the person who has that dominance channel. So the first one we are going to look at, look at is Bonnie's acceptance channel. And this is the ability, her ability to come up with answers when she has this mental organization. So think of having a Google Drive in your brain. An answer may appear when everything is sorted and nice, or you might just filter through it and it's just like, oh, here's the one thing that I was looking for. Now, it may have bothered Bonnie that Clyde wasn't able to give someone else control because she would have to accept that. And projectors, we have to remember that Bonnie was likely a projector and projectors have this piercing sharp aura. It's like someone running at you with a knife when it's uninvited. So think about that when we're talking about projector aura. Now manifestors have a closed protective aura. So if you think of me with my hoodie and I'm kind of just like pulling on this, you can think of my hoodie as a manifestors closed protective aura. I'm not a manifestor, I'm a projector, but I like hoodies. Anyway, so let's talk about the uninvited projector attempting to pierce that manifestor security system, their aura, right? It's it's war at that point. So while spending a holiday with Clyde, Buck and Blanche Barrow, which is Clyde's brother and sister-in-law, Buck and Blanche actually witnessed Bonnie and Clyde throwing objects at each other, yelling, screaming. They were hitting each other. It wasn't just like that. Like they described it as they were like wailing at each other. Like it was legitimate like fist fighting. So I don't know how else to describe it. Just full on trying to kill each other type of thing. And this specific event, I just want to say that like they did swing at each other often. That's what uh, members of the Barrow gang, their family had said, but this specific event happened after Bonnie lost her ability to walk. So she still demanded to be listened to, to the point she would physically attack and be attacked to get her point across while she's, she can't even walk due to battery acid burning the crap out of her legs. And that's how much she wanted to get her point across. And 
W.D. Jones, who was a 16-year-old member of the Barrow Gang, he said, sometime after we got back on the road, Clyde crashed the car. It burned, and Bonnie was burned so bad that the flesh on her right leg was cooked down to the bone. I could see the bone for about five inches above her right ankle. So think about that. Bonnie never got real medical care for it. She couldn't. She couldn't go to a hospital. But after that happened, she still wanted to fight Clyde. And she was willing to have Clyde hit her back and yell at her back and throw things at her the way she was with him just to make that point across. So there it is. <laughs> and Clyde's mother, Kimmy Barrow, she initially had really harsh things to say about Bonnie. And she one time saw Bonnie listening to the radio and Bonnie was just anxious to hear whether there was any news about Clyde. So Kumi asked Bonnie, like, why don't you ever try to stop him? Bonnie said that she didn't want to say things like that because he would just get distracted and unable to get his job done. And Kumi actually thought much higher about Bonnie after that conversation. So you can also see that Bonnie did have her moments where she just kind of understood, like, my opinion isn't invited here, so I'm not going to share it. Or she could see a consequence to her giving her opinion. Again, uninvited. Now let's look at Clyde's channel here. He's got the channel of community. And this is about bringing people together through understanding some sort of life's purpose. I'm just gonna use life purpose as it's kind of like a generic term because obviously Clyde isn't sitting here next to me telling me what he felt his life's purpose was. And so when Clyde kind of understands what he wants, what his purpose is, he actually invites people to come along. And if the right people are invited, he, you know, they all kind of get to do it together. Now there was a, a guy that he was in prison with. His name is Ralph Fultz. And he, he was an inmate with Clyde. They arrived at Eastham together and he kind of gave Clyde this rundown of how the prison worked. So Fultz mentioned that since he, Fultz, escaped prison in the past, he was going to face more severe punishment when he got there. And the next day, Clyde watched as Fultz got beaten by half a dozen inmates. But Clyde actually made it a point to help Fultz up to his feet and take care of Fultz and Fultz's wounds after that and the guards threatened to do the same to him but Clyde valued his loyalty more than he valued his life now this was a prison that you had to run to work in the morning and if you walked or you were too slow the guards could just shoot you and kill you they could literally just do anything to you so that actually shows quite a bit about Clyde over, like his loyalty over his life rather when he was being great every day nobody helped him because it was very much like if it's not Clyde it's gonna be me so nobody tried to help Clyde just to draw that comparison of through loyalty versus life so Clyde's loyalty to faults actually got him sent to one of the worst dorms and that's where the rape was happening they were separated but Clyde never abandoned faults and Clyde actually only served two years of his 14 year sentence for not returning a rental car but his mother had this persistency and she tried to secure him parole so after serving two of the 14 year sentence he got out and when he got out immediately he started getting involved in several jailbreaks in East Ham including helping faults get out now I do want to be clear I talked about he wanted to be clean he wanted to have a stable job and leave it behind but due to the harassment he's like okay bet like jailbreak time so Clyde's feelings about someone also had no effect on his loyalty, and this would actually prove to be his downfall. That was part of his gang. Henry Mechvin was a member of the Barrow Gang, and he was involved in this high-profile killing of a highway patrolman named H.D. Murphy. Now, it's kind of lost to time who actually fired at him and who killed him, but the story goes that Meth Clyde had said something, and Mechvin took it as Clyde wanted him, Mechvin, to shoot Murphy. And it was known to not want to fight, right? He'd rather flee than fight. That's why when we say like, well, Bonnie and Clyde weren't actually like that great. They sucked at robbing. They sucked at shooting and they pretty much kind of sucked at everything. So the story goes that he said something to Methvin about it and Methvin actually shot. And that's when, and apparently Clyde was really pissed off about it. But of course, because this happened and they turned, they just killed this highway patrolman who wasn't really doing anything but his usual routine job. And usually there's where he was patrolling, nobody was there. And when he was killed, the public that was supporting Bonnie and Clyde that was just like, yeah, like you got this, like living vicariously through Bonnie and Clyde, boom, that one incident turned it into public outrage. And it makes sense. And it was a few days before H.D. Murphy's marriage and he was supposed to get married and instead, she had to go to a funeral for the man she loved. She wore her wedding dress to his funeral and pictures were taken. It was all over the news. And you can see how this turned the public support against Bonnie and Clyde. Now, Methvin's family knew that Methvin, Henry Methvin, would likely get the chair since he'd already been implicated in several police murders. And Methvin's mother knew that Bonnie and Clyde had a soft spot for helping people who broke down on the side of the road. So she used that 
to ambush them. She was working with this Texas Ranger who was really, really well known for being able to capture people like Bonnie and Clyde. And in exchange for leniency for Henry, she was going to give them Bonnie and Clyde. So she ended up pretending that her car broke down the side of the road. And apparently the thought process was like, well, since Bonnie and Clyde were loyal to the Methvins anyway, she kind of used that to lure them to help her with the broken down car. And what ended up happening was they got 150 bullets pelted into their stolen car. And that was that. I hope you enjoyed this reading.